Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Jerome Green. I'm chairing this call. So today on the call, we have um, uh, Dr. Phil Lee, who, um, or Professor Phil Lee, sorry, who uh, will give a talk on the cross-disorder GWAS analysis of the PGC, so innate psychiatric disorders. Uh, it's quite an exciting talk, I think. Um, we're just gonna wait for a minute or so to, for people to join the call. Um, but I see we're already up to 55 participants. So we'll, we'll start the call momentarily. Okay, so I think we can we can go ahead with a call um, now the presentation. So over to you, Phil. Uh, thank you so much, Jerome. And also, uh, thank you for this opportunity to talk at the PGC Worldwide Land Meeting. I mean, I think it's been a I think it's been a more than actually four years since we uh, submitted the proposal for PGC two cross disorder analysis to uh, PGC disorder work groups and. Uh, we are very excited to, to finalize this cross disorder analysis study and also to share uh, the findings with all PGC investigators. And also, oh, feel free to interrupt me at any time while I'm, I'm talking if you have any uh, further questions. So today's talk consists of three main parts. First, I'm going to give a brief overview uh, about the, why we want to study the shared genetics of psychiatric disorders. Uh, then I'm going to discuss the major findings from the PGC2 cross disorder study and also conclude with discussing uh, some of the unresolved issues and the future research directions. So uh, we well know that the psychiatrists probably only medical field that there is no uh, pathologic data to make diagnosis. Instead, we have this handbook called DSM, uh, which basically lists all of these different diagnostic criteria for making clinical diagnosis based on this symptom profile and also behavioral measures. And as a field has gained more expertise from this clinical practice, DSM also uh, has gone several revisions. Uh, the DSM-1 first started with about two dozens of psychiatric disorders, and now it evolved into DSM-5, which includes uh, diagnostic labels for at least 265 uh, distinct psychiatric conditions. So uh, there's a clear practical utility of this current diagnostic system, but its uh, lack of ideologic basis has been often criticized for its validity. Uh, Thomas Inzel, uh, the former director of the NIMH, has illustrated this issue uh, very vividly in this part. So basically, uh, while DSM has been described as a Bible for the field, it is at best a dictionary. And DSM diagnoses are based on consensus about clusters of clinical symptoms, but not any objective laboratory measure. And in the rest of medicine, this would be equivalent to creating diagnostic systems based on the nature of chest pain or uh, the quality of fever. And indeed, uh, decades of these epidemiologic studies also report that uh, diagnostic boundaries between psychiatric disorders are uh, not clear at all. So overlapping symptoms are frequent among patients. And we also observe this massive comorbidity and also uh, high coheritability uh, for distinct psychiatric disorders. So naturally, these uh, questions about whether these dis clinically distinct disorders have uh, ideologically distinct basis arise. And also, 
uh, some may argue that the psychiatric disorders are just conditions with <coughs> overlapping foundations. And some may even argue that the psychiatric disorders may be just different variation of one underlying medical condition. So clarifying nosologic boundaries and ideologic overlap is really key to uh, this question of what constitutes psychopathology and also this has uh, important implication for uh, the identification of disease gene and also risk prediction as well as development of new treatment strategies. And uh, over the past decade, cross disorder genetics have provided a really powerful insights to address some of these fundamental questions about the nosology and ideology of major psychiatric disorders. So for example, uh, this uh, landmark study by International Schizophrenia Consortium, this study uh, not only reported this massive polygenicity of schizophrenia, but it also uh, demonstrated that this aggregated polygenic risk of schizophrenia also contributes to the risk of bipolar disorders, but not to other non-psychiatric disorders. And later, PGC cross disorder group study led by Hong Mi and Naomi Wei also confirmed this surprising degree of genetic overlap among ma five major PGC1 psychiatric disorders using this uh, bivariate analysis of genome wide SNP data. And more recently, the Brainstorm Consortium study, also led by PGC investigators, uh, confirm this is significant genetic correlations are very specific to psychiatric disorders, but not among neurological diseases or little genetic correlation was observed between psychiatric and neurologic diseases. And more interestingly, actually, also this is significant genetic correlations was observed between major psychiatric disorders and this variation in a range of uh, behavioral, cognitive, and personality traits in the normal population, uh, suggesting their shared genetic basis. And in addition to this more genome-wide level comparative analysis, we have also begun to identify uh, the specific risk loci and genes with shared risk effects on uh, 5PGC1 disorders. <clears throat> and identification of this pleiotropic risk loci also led to the discovery of the specific genetic risk mechanisms that have a shared ideological role across a range of disorders we studied. And notable examples include this discovery of calcium channel signaling genes and also <clears throat> the role of neuronal, immune, and histone pathways uh, reported by this PGC network and pathway analysis group. So uh, in the PGC2 cross disorder study, we uh, aim to expand these prior uh, cross disorder studies by expanding uh, to include a more broader range of clinically distinct disorders. So here, uh, this table summarizes the uh, eight disorder data sets we included in our study. Uh, the eight disorders are specifically schizophrenia, major depression, bipolar disorder, ADHD, ASD, uh, the five PGC1 disorders, but now with all drastically increases sample sizes. Also, we had uh, this new ad, uh, disorder data sets, TRES syndrome, anorexia, and OCD. Uh, in total, the number of cases were about 232,000 subjects. And the number of controls were about 494,000 controls. 
all obtained from uh, combined studies of uh, 165 cohorts. Uh, in cross disorder study, we restricted to uh, study subjects of only European ancestry and to minimize potential heterogeneity across different disorder data sets. And you may also notice that there are uh, vast differences in terms of sample sizes for individual disorders we included in our study. And these differences in statistical power is also uh, noted by this different number of genome-wide significant loci uh, identified for each of these individual disorders. And this also has uh, limited our power to to detect pleiotropic risk effects across these different studies. And I'm going to discuss more on uh, details about that in, in the later slide. So using these data sets, we had three major aims. Uh, first, we uh, wanted to understand whether there is any shared ideologic structure or genetic relationship between these uh, eight psychiatric disorders. And we also aim to uh, identify specific uh, risk loci and genes with uh, broad pleiotropic effects. And lastly, we wanted to investigate whether there are any functional features of pleiotropic risk loci that could explain their broad effects on the psychophysiology. In general. Uh, to investigate this shared ideology structure across eight psychiatric disorders, we first assess the genetic relation uh, between these eight psychiatric disorders. Uh, the results were largely consistent with previous estimates. Uh, but significant genetic correlation were apparent for a uh, much larger number of disorder pairs than previously reported in the brainstorm consortium study. And in particular, uh, these five PGC1 disorders, now with the largest sample sizes, all share their significant genetic correlation uh, with each other. And among the remaining three disorders, uh, anorexia and OCD shows very similar genetic relationship with other disorders. Uh, these OCD and anorexia were uh, significantly associated with each other and also with all of other adult onset disorders, but uh, not much with these two childhood onset disorders, ADHD and ASD. But based on our prior studies, uh, it is possible that this lack of correlation may be due to uh, limited power in the compared data sets in this case. And it was also notable to see uh, there's significant negative correlation between anorexia and ADHD, here denoted as a little orange uh, color, uh, which may demand further investigation. And in contrast to anorexia and OCD, uh, Tourette syndrome showed actually quite distinct genetic relationships with uh, other disorders. Uh, particularly, uh, its lack of genetic correlation was very clear with schizophrenia and bipolar, which was not seen in other disorders. And using this genetic correlation analysis results, uh, investigators led by uh, Elliot Tapadrab at U of Texas uh, ran uh, exploratory factor analysis, followed by this genomic structure iteration modeling uh, they, de they developed. And using this analysis, they could identify this uh, model with uh, three uh, latent factors as a best fit for uh, our data uh, compared to other various models they investigated. And these three factor model, uh, among these three factor models, the first factor 
uh, consists of anorexia, OCD, and Tourette syndrome. Uh, three disorders are uh, characterized by their compulsive behaviors. And the second factor uh, included schizophrenia, bipolar, and major depression, which we could classify as a mood and psychotic disorders. And the third factor included these uh, three early onset neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, Tourette syndrome, ADHD, and ASD. And interestingly, this factor also included major depression as one of its components. So uh, in summary, this analysis uh, identified that there is a significant genetic correlation between these uh, eight psychiatric disorders. Here we depict as an uh, undirected network structure. And this complex and also higher order relationships we could simplify as a three latent factor groups. But uh, we also note that uh, these three latent factors all together could explain about half of the genetic variation in the uh, eight neuropsychiatric disorders. So which suggests that the, there are also other latent factors or uh, domains that uh, compose this complex network structure between uh, these eight psychiatric disorders. And we uh, pursued the detection of this pleiotropic risk loci and genes uh, by using uh, cross disorder meta analysis. So this figure outlines the, uh, the analytic framework that we apply. So starting with this individual uh, some of the level association statistics that we have obtained from uh, individual disorder work groups, we apply this unified quality control procedures to, to standardize uh, the study data sets. And then we apply uh, generalized fixed effects meta-analysis method uh, that could take into account uh, the differences in sample sizes and also overlapping subjects across uh, these eight disorder data sets. And also they could allow uh, detection of subset specific effects. And then we applied conditional analysis for uh, identifying independent association signals and then uh, used a uh, posterior probability framework called MVALUE estimation to quantify disorder specific association for individual uh, locus. Uh, before I go into the details of this analysis findings, I'd like to uh, point out that uh, unlike the GWAS of individual disorders, uh, taking care, properly taking care of this sharing of study subject across different data sets is, is, is critical in cross disorder studies. Um, now, because PGC studies have uh, made these summary states publicly available on the PGC website, uh, I often see that the non-PGC investigators actually uh, use these data sets as if they are independent uh, without any sharing of subject. But uh, we know that there is extensive sharing of study subject across disorders and especially for uh, controls. Uh, and this table shows the proportion of controls shared among different disorder data sets. Mm. And I'm sorry for some cells show the zero, but it's actually because of precedent issue. There's hardly no, uh, in the, uh, no zero percent sharing between these disorder data sets. And for some of disorder pairs, this Control sharing is very expensive, especially for schizophrenia, bipolar, and between autism, ADHD, and MDD, and also with an anorexia with other uh, adult onset disorders. And there are also cases where uh, cases in one disorder uh, are also controls in the other disorder studies. 
so the the this case control sharing was uh, minimal in the PGC studies, and also we found a modest level of case case sharing, uh, but mostly coming from these ISAIC consortium data sets. And this uh, control sharing of controls actually causes us a uh, critical problem in the meta-analysis because the basic assumption of meta-analysis is the independence of the analyzed data sets. So for example, this figure depicts the cases uh, in comparison of three studies uh, with no overlapping uh, study subject versus the cases with extensive study overlapping cases. And uh, when the, uh, this study ABC are independent, then the, there is no correlation of uh, summary level association statistics under the null model. So uh, corresponding this variance covariance matrix uh, listed on the bottom of the slide shows that the uh, covariance between these disorders also uh, are at zero. And the, for simplicity, variance of the studies were all set to one. But when there are these shared controls or shared subjects, uh, correlation here depicted as a, a edge between these three study not, nodes, then the covariance, correlation occurs and also covariation, covariance uh, increases to greater than zero. And uh, most straightforward way to decouple these dependencies between studies is actually just getting rid of all shared subjects by splitting them into distinct studies. So in, the ca in this case, we can see that the by splitting these subjects, uh, individual study, the sample sizes of individual studies get decreased. And as a result, we have no correlation between the summary set, but also the variance of each study that reflect this decreased sample sizes are uh, increased. And uh, subsequently, this variant, uh, decoupled variance can be used in the meta-analysis framework. But uh, manually splitting this overlapping subject is almost infeasible uh, in the PGC studies because we are dealing with hundreds of study cohorts with eight distinct mm -hmm. psychiatric conditions. So in our case, we uh, use this analytic approaches uh, to, to uh, estimate this inflated correlation due to shared subjects. Uh, largely based on this Lean and Sullivan's work in, uh, presented in 2009, and also later extended by this Bata, Charlie, et al. To, to accommodate all different types of case-case uh, control, control, and also case control sharings. So in, in short, the meta-analysis we use uh, first start with uh, counting the exact number of overlapping subjects across these eight disorder data sets. And we use this analytic strategy to calculate inflated correlation. And subsequently, we can use to calculate variance covariance matrix and then decouple this induced covariance and then use in the meta-analysis framework. And once we identify a significant loci from this meta-analysis, we uh, quantify this disorder specific association using uh, posterior probability uh, that uh, not only taking into account the strength of this observed effect size for uh, individual disorder, but also uh, taking into account whether this effect size is uh, similar to other, to the ones that uh, are observed in other disorder studies. So uh, this framework also prefers the uh, association signals that have the similar effect sizes across uh, eight disorder data sets. 
And as illustrated on this graph on the bottom, uh, N value estimate of gradient 0.9 uh, was used to predict uh, high confidence uh, with high confidence that the, this specific shape has uh, effects with on this specific uh, disorder that I said. And for the interest of time, I'm not going to go into much of this detail, but we have run uh, extensive simulation studies to uh, confirm that this N value estimate works properly for uh, the cases with uh, eight disorders with unbalanced sample sizes because we had these huge differences in the state of power. And, and this simulation confirms that the N value estimate we observed for the uh, much smaller data sets like OCD, A8, anorexia, or TRED, actually, we could have high confidence for the genuine signal. So using this uh, generalized fixed effect meta-analysis, we could identify uh, a total of 146 uh, genome-wide significant loci. And based on the N value estimation, about uh, 109 loci were predicted to have a pseudotropic risk effect versus 37 were associated with a single disorder. And as you can imagine, most of this single disorder loci are associated with either schizophrenia or major depression. As you can see here, the strongest signal comes from this MHC region uh, with strongly associated with schizophrenia. The second uh, strongest signal is pointing to this passion channel signaling gene that is associated with schizophrenia and bipolar. And for this uh, top genome-wide significant loci, we use these various functional annotation and genomics resources to assign uh, candidate genes for the regions. So basically, uh, for these identified index SNPs and their credible SNPs for the regions, uh, genes were assigned if the identify SNPs are located within the genes or targets of EQTL regulation or interacting with the target genes based on this brain high C data. And this table summarizes some of our top loci with the broadest pleiotropic effects. So the uh, first few lines summarize the information about uh, in, uh, index SNP tagging individual loci. And the following column shows the candidate genes that we assign to the region based on these various functional uh, genomics data. And the following eight columns shows the N value estimate, basically uh, quantifying our confidence about the association of the identified SNP with these specific disorders. And the last column shows a number of associated disorders based on this M value threshold of uh, 0.9. And you can see that the number of disorder configuration actually varies from 8, 7 to 4, which show and also various configuration of associated disorders. And the, uh, the locus with the most significant uh, pleiotropic effect uh, was identified on this chromosome 18 region. And this index SNP actually reside in this netrin-1 receptor gene called DCC, and which encompasses about, I think, 400 kb region on the upstream uh, within this DCC gene. And as you can see in the forest plot in the middle, this index SNP uh, carries risk effects to all of the eight disorders, and the effect sizes 
uh, are similar among all eight disorders, and that's why uh, our posterior probability based on M value estimates uh, boosted uh, for some of the smaller data sets as well. And we could also uh, observe that based on this GTEx uh, brain EQTL data, uh, this index SNP we identified is also cis EQTL markers for gene GCC, which support this gene GCC as, again, a strong candidate gene for the association signal we identified. So basically, as you can see in this left figure, uh, the more number of risk allele uh, individual have, the lesser expression of this gene uh, will occur. And also, uh, core localization analysis uh, confirmed that both of our meta-analysis summary stat using our meta-analysis summary stat and also text EQTL data confirms uh, this EQTL signal uh, represents co uh, co-localized uh, our cross disorder association signals. And it's interesting that the uh, postmodern brain gene expression data actually shows that uh, this gene DCC shows uh, significantly higher gene expression in early prenatal age, but it also shows highly significant expression uh, throughout life span um, in various brain regions we investigated. And uh, this DCC gene, also called the natrin one receptor, uh, prior studies actually have reported this uh, its key role in uh, guiding axonal growth during neurodevelopment. And also, uh, this gene was shown to serve as a master regulator of midline crossing and white matter uh, projections. And Interestingly, rare mutation within this gene have also been linked to uh, the complete or partial absence of the corpus callosum and also has been linked to uh, genetic syndromes uh, involving intellectual disability. And additionally, loss of this gene DCC in the mouse model also altered uh, the development of prefrontal dopaminergic circuitry during uh, adolescence. And another interesting feature of this gene is also uh, based on this BWAS data, uh, its association with this broad range of neurocognitive behavior measures, specifically this gene ha is associated with uh, intelligence, neuro neuroticism, education attainment, and social interaction, and also depressive symptoms, as well as insomnia. Uh, for the interest of time, I, we cannot really illustrate all of these uh, pleiotropic risk loci individually, but uh, we could see that uh, many of these pleiotropic risk loci that are associated with uh, more than five or four disorders show some of uh, common features. First, uh, they showed really highly specific and enriched brain expression. And also many of them were involved in a uh, very versatile role in the brain. For example, uh, in the case of BCL11A as a, uh, playing, as a, playing a role as a transcription factor or chromatin remodeling complex or RBFOX1 that uh, work as a regulator of alternative splicing, or in case of SORC S3, that work as a sorting and signaling uh, receptor. And many of these identified loci also were associated with uh, neurocognitive behavior measures, ranging from uh, educational attainment, intelligence, to, to neuroticism, alcohol dependence, and so on. And 
some of the loci were also associated with the psychiatric disorder we didn't include in this study, right? Uh, I call dependence or conduct disorder and so on. So potentially suggesting their even broader role in including other psychiatric condition. Uh, we also identified uh, about a dozen of loci with uh, opposite directional effects between different dis distinct disorders. Uh, about three of these loci had opposite effects between schizophrenia and MDD, or two between schizophrenia and ASD, and one loci between major depression and bipolar, and so on. But for most of these re, uh, associated signals, uh, it was hard to infer their functional role because many of the regions didn't have uh, any genes or uh, just mapped to non-coding RNA regions that we hardly had any functional data. So further investigation is needed for uh, actually teaching apart the role of this association uh, regions, but one of the interesting cases was found in this one locus with opposite directional effects between anorexia and schizophrenia. So uh, this region is actually found within the intron of gene called CUL3, but GTEx EQTL data uh, points that uh, this association is actually a cis regulation marker for uh, the upstream gene called FMAM124B. And uh, interestingly, this specific gene has been associated with strong uh, risk gene for body mass in index in the latest meta analysis study of more than 700,000 individuals. So basically uh, connecting this uh, shared genetic with opposite directional effect between anorexia, schizophrenia, and potentially uh, linked with this uh, metabolic trace that we, we that may uh, demand further investigation. Uh, next, we investigated whether there are any specific uh, functional features uh, of our pleiotropic risk loci compared to uh, single disorder associated ones. For example, it was uh, hypothesized that the uh, genes affecting multiple traits are more likely to experience uh, stronger prefrontal selection. But when we examined uh, individual loci that have either pleiotropic association versus a single disorder association, uh, we couldn't find any uh, evidence to support uh, a stronger evolutionary constraint on the pleiotropic risk loci. And we also examined uh, various functional and uh, genomic features uh, of these two groups, but also there was no distinct difference in terms of various uh, features, including the ones that are listed here. Uh, when we compared the genes that are identified in these two distinct groups, we also could see that the uh, neuropsychiatric risk loci were regardless of whether they are pleiotropic risk loci or single disorder associated loci, uh, these genes were highly intolerant to loss of function uh, mutations. And also uh, both groups of genes showed a uh, very specific enriched expression in the brain and also pituitary region. Um, Difference between these two groups of loci were actually observed when we run gene set enrichment analysis using uh, this program MEGMA. So uh, when we run this analysis on 
pleiotropic tropic risk loci and non pleiotropic tropic risk loci separately. And then we compared or contrasted or identified gene sets using this MDS uh, analysis. And here, uh, the gene sets are significantly associated with uh, both groups are depicted as a red mark versus the ones specific to pleiotropic risk loci are blue and the ones associated with single disorder associated loci that are mostly schizophrenia and MDD are represented by green dots. And you can see that there is very distinct association of these genes uh, also, uh, involved in neurogenesis or uh, regulation of nervous system development or neurodifferentiation for uh, pleiotropic risk loci. And both genes groups were involved in uh, many processes related to postsynapse, synapse, or dendrite regions. And there are many genes that's actually clustered in this region. And most of them are actually comes from this either major depression or uh, schizophrenia associated group, uh, including various neurotransmitter receptor activity or regulation of neurotransmitter. And also more specifically, including acetylcholine receptor activity or cholinergic synaptic transmission. But uh, interestingly, only glutamate receptor signaling that actually clustered here together were specifically associated to uh, this pleiotropic risk loci. And cell type specific enrichment also showed uh, this specific enrichment of pleiotropic risk genes uh, in neuron uh, cell types and also this human cortical layer uh, of postmodern brain data also suggests that this uh, enrichment of pleiotropic risk loci genes in uh, cortical glutomergic neurons that are uh, consistent with our prior gene set findings of glutomergic uh, signaling uh, association. Then uh, investigator at the uh, UNC and also uh, Dengue Students Lab performed more refined analysis of this cell type specific enrichment. Uh, they uh, group our top genomic loci into three groups of roughly equal sizes based on their pleiotropic risk association. And here you can see that the consistent with our prior enrichment of pleiotropic risk genes in the neuron, now we can see that clear a uh, gradient of this stronger enrichment for the risk loci with a large number of disorder association. And also, uh, pleiotropic risk loci uh, are specifically enriched among the genes that are expressed in this frontal cortex region compared to other cortical regions. And more interestingly, this uh, spatial temporal brain gene expression data analysis that shows that uh, pleiotropic risk loci actually shows this uh, with increasing uh, gene expression during early prenatal age, the peak in this middle uh, prenatal term, and then shows a gradual decrease along the prenatal age. But also during the postnatal stage, this uh, pleiotropic risk loci with uh, higher uh, number of risk associations shows much increased gene expression uh, compared to uh, less pleiotropic risk group and also compared to single disorder associated pleiotropic group, uh, which is, is quite interesting. And, uh, and in contrast, this single disorder associated loci shows a very uh, significant peak in the early stage of prenatal age and shows a very dramatic decrease uh, throughout the prenatal development. 
but also shows a consistent level of range and expression uh, during the lifespan. So uh, in summary, I think our study uh, indicates that there is substantial pairwise genetic correlation between uh, these eight psychiatric disorders. And uh, we have also found this evidence that uh, this higher level genetic structure uh, between these multiple uh, psychiatric disorders point to a uh, fair number of broader domains that underlie genetic risk to uh, psychopathology. And the, we could also uh, identify specific uh, risk loci with various disorder configurations, and as well as the ones with uh, this opposite directional effects between uh, distinct disorders. And uh, we could uh, observe some of the functional properties of these pleiotropic risk loci. Uh, many of them were uh, master regulators that perform a very diverse range of biological uh, role, including chromatin regulation, ax axon guidance, and white mirror integrity and so on. And they also played a key role in early uh, brain development. And, but their uh, heightened expression was also apparent uh, throughout the lifespan, uh, suggesting their cascading effects. And we could identify there's in which expression specifically in neurons for this pleiotropic risk loci, and also very particularly uh, for the glutamatergic neurons and uh, frontal cortex regions. And uh, we do note that the, because of the difference in the power of these eight disorder data sets, we actually have uh, limited power to detect some of the pleiotropic effects uh, involving these underrepresented disorders of smaller sample sizes. So uh, as a matter of time, I may skip this part. And then I'm going to just briefly uh, summarize some of future research directions we are envisioning. So uh, some of the major confounding factors that we could, uh, we could not actually uh, study in this cross disorder analysis is uh, how to tease apart these uh, confounding issues of including sampling biases or misclassifications or comorbidity uh, data. So I think the Brainstorm paper actually had an extensive work teasing apart the issue of misclassification and, and so on. And we are aware of this study uh, from the ISAC consortium that uh, affect in investigate how this uh, comorbidity uh, data can relate are uh, related to uh, this cross disorder uh, effects between distinct disorders, and also. Uh, leveraging various phenotype data, including clinical symptoms and subtypes and severity of uh, these distinct disorders were uh, underway uh, within the PGC, especially uh, by uh, recently reported by PGC schizophrenia and bipolar work group and also uh, PGC MDB work groups. And I think the PGC investigators are now uh, actively collecting this uh, phenotype data and uh, investigating this phenotype data in, and their cross disorder effects would be uh, really uh, key missing part that uh, we, we couldn't pursue. And uh, we also wanna relate this cross disorder effects to a various range of neurocognitive and imaging data uh, analysis. And finally, uh, connecting this shared role of common SNPs with, again, the implication of rare CMVs and the rare single nucleotide variants will uh, provide valuable insights to further tease apart these cross-disorder genetics 
of measures like capture disorders. So uh, in summary, I'd like to also acknowledge that the, the work that I presented today is really uh, dedicated uh, work from these PGC cross disorder work group members. So I'd like to uh, express my special thanks to all of them and also CDG analysis group members. And we're also very grateful to all PGC disorder work groups, especially Mark Daly and Stefan Lukem and other uh, individual analysis group uh, members who contributed to CDG study. And all participants, study participants for the PGC and ISAI Consortium and 23andMe and UK Biobank and also uh, all funding sources. So I think I would like to conclude my talk here and I'd be happy to uh, answer any of questions. Okay, thank you, Phil, for an excellent talk. Um, so to ask questions, um, there are two mechanisms. There's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screens and there's a chat button. And I've been posting some messages there encouraging questions. Um, we have one comment from Brenda Finucan, um, which I think is a slightly nuanced comment, but it's basically about pleiotrophy and whether it's, it's actually technically pleiotrophy that you found or whether it's different clinical presentations uh, of, the, uh, of the same underlying brain dysfunction. Uh, but I think that's a rather nuanced, that's a sort of slightly nuanced point. I guess, Phil, one question that occurs to me is, in terms of polygenic risk scoring, from this it would appear that there's scope to develop a cross-disorder polygenic risk score, but perhaps using some sort of adjusted or even quite complex weighting strategy. Um, have you discussed this? And if so, what do you think the potential for having a you know, general psychopathology polygenic risk scoring perhaps underlying those factors that you presented? Um, what you, is that going to be useful, do you think? Yeah, that's a very interesting point. So I didn't have actually time to uh, go into further details, but I think that some of the groups actually have used this polygenic risk scoring based on different subgroups or subtypes of disorders and examined whether this different polygenic scoring has different association with uh, cross disorder relations. And the, uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a really uh, promising direction that we could further uh, move ahead. At this point, it, it's still unclear to, to generate pollution risk score from the shared uh, meta-analysis. So the many ways people uh, perform this analysis is actually generating pollution risk score based on MDD, schizophrenia, and bipolar, uh, and so on as separately, and it kind of apply more multivariate analysis to infer more uh, combined risk score uh, profile. But I think ultimately, if we could identify these more latent factors that represent shared risk effect, we can generate polygenic score that representing these fewer broad domains and then uh, assess the polygenic risk score for individuals. Okay. And then another question is the role of neuro neurodegenerative disorders, because it's often forgotten, I think, in psychiatry these days that Alzheimer's is still a psychiatric disorder, and we do have a new and exciting PGC work group in Alzheimer's. So have you looked at whether there's any risk loci that are shared between the different disorders in Alzheimer's disease? Mm, we haven't really analyzed Alzheimer's disease yet, but I recall that actually one of our top risk loci, I think it was SORC S3 or, uh, I'm not sure about the specific name, but actually were associated with Alzheimer disease. And also we do see uh, several loci that are actually uh, are, are associated with either epilepsy or migraine or 
other types of neurodegenerative disorders. So I think regardless of there is little genetic correlation at a genome-wide level between psychiatric disorders and neurological disorders, but I think at an uh, individual variant level, we do see uh, there is a low side that are affecting all this range of brain disorders at the same time. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Phil. So do we have any questions? So people, do people want to type anything into the chat window or raise their hand in the chat? Okay, so we have a, uh, a question from Michael Wagner. So I think you might, you might have answered this already, but will it be possible to develop, derive a pleiotrophic, perhaps neurodevelopmental polygenic risk score and a purified, perhaps disease specific polygenic risk score for each disorder. Um, so I guess, but I, but I guess we, we've discussed that. Um, I, I, did, you, did you attempt to control the, each disorder for all the rest of the disorders using some of the methods that are out there? Or have, was that discussed in the group? Uh, I'm not sure I understood your question actually. As in to condition to condition the GWAS statistics for one disorder on all of the other disorders. Uh, uh, no, I, 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 we, we haven't really. Okay. Right. Okay. So I think if there are no further questions, I think it just remains for us to, for me to thank Phil Phil Lee for giving an excellent presentation, and uh, it's been a huge amount of work. This paper is very very interesting. So thank you again for presenting it to us today. And thank you so much for your invitation. Okay, thank you. So the talk will go up on YouTube and I'd like to thank everyone for uh, attending. Thank you. <laughs>